wind turbines technology over a dozen years ago to help with the uh, states and nation's energy transformation and assembled and led the team that deployed the Valtern US, um, which was the first grid-connected floating offshore wind turbine in the United States. Uh, and that, that technology led to over 40 patents uh, and $150 million of investment with DOE and the offshore wind companies. So we're so excited, uh, Dr. Uh, Habib Dagar, for you to share your expertise uh, on floating offshore wind turbines with us. Take it away. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You can so you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, can hear you great. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure to be with all of you today. And I hear so much. So this is not time. And, uh, and uh, that's why the way that they were saying, saying, how did the extreme wave and wind events and in the Gulf of Maine were designing these turbines for 70-foot waves and uh, 130, 40 mile per hour winds. Um, so um, they're more to see about using morning anchors. You see that there's three morning lines on, just like you have morning lines on ship, uh, and they're designed uh, to uh, to sustain 50 and 500 year uh, return period events. So my presentation um, has five components. I tell you about us and how we got here. I'm going to talk about the potential of floating wind and why do we want to use floating turbines. We'll talk about the engineering of floating wind and how does a floating wind turbine actually float. Uh, we'll talk about the experience in floating wind. What, how do we get here in Maine when we start and where we're heading? And then to, I'll talk throughout the presentation about what are the opportunities, what are the challenges to make floating wind a reality from an engineering perspective, other perspectives as well. But uh, uh, not too long ago, the Biden administration has announced floating wind as an next earth shot, one of the earth shots, and announced a goal of 15 gigawatts of floating wind by 2035, and is looking for reducing uh, the cost of floating wind by 70% to get us down 45 cents a kilowatt hour. So that's, these are all challenging goals, but, but now they're national goals. This is a laboratory at the University of Maine. The University of Maine um, uh, is a grant land grant institution that we created in 1865. And uh, our research center was established to the National Science Foundation close to 26 years ago. Today, we have 350 people working in the lab. And our strategic plan is called GEM. It's called, it stands for Green Energy and Materials. So our goal is to bring green energy and materials to society. Uh, welcome to work with all of you as, as you, you enter that journey. To give you a sense of what we've done, this is a shot from inside the lab. Uh, that's a wind turbine blade uh, being tested to make sure it will not fall off, as you heard the question before, and, and break off and, 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 and cause problems. So this is a, a blade being tested in our laboratory to simulate 25 years of wear and tear on it uh, in about two, three months in the lab. So, so there are engineering methods to, uh, to essentially determine that, that these, these systems will not fail during their lifetime, and if they're, particularly if they're, uh, 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 there's good operation maintenance plans. This is another facility we built in our laboratory to look at um, extreme wind and wave storms. We call it W square, or the Wave Wind Laboratory. Notice what we have, we have a wave basin to create extreme waves, but we also have a wind open jet wind tunnel to create extreme uh, wind events. And combining those two, we can recreate almost any weather on Earth at scale. Uh, and uh, you could see a wind turbine, floating wind turbine being tested in our laboratory to ensure that we'll hold up in these extreme events. Here's what uh, the, the, the laboratory looks like as it's operating. Um, so this is, um, this is how we create waves. As I said, in the Gulf of Maine, we're designing for 70-foot extreme waves. Um, and, uh, and this is a wind machine that creates wind storms over wave storms. And these turbines are being modeled in our laboratory, but also placed um, um, in this facility to make sure that our models actually work. And here's examples of some of the waves that we're creating in the laboratory. And a wind turbine in a 50-year uh, return period uh, wave and wind event. Now. Now, what is the potential for floating wind? Why? What is floating wind? What is fixed bottom wind? If you have real shallow waters off your coast, less than 150 feet of water, you can fix the turbine to the seabed. And that's what they've been doing in Europe here since 1991. But um, it just so, so turns out that two thirds of the US waters, uh, uh, offshore wind resource within 50 miles, is in deep waters, more than 150 feet of water, where you can't really fix the turbines to the seabed. It's too costly to do so. So you'd have to float the turbines, and uh, and that's what floating technology uh, when it's used. Um, just to give you a sense, two thirds of the US offshore wind resource 
requires floating technologies. And what you see in dark blue here are the areas both on the east coast and west coast that require floating turbines. The light blue areas are the areas where you could use fixed bottom turbines where you have shallow waters. And as you see in the Gulf of Maine, uh, it's all dark blue, so we have to use floating turbines. And that's why we've been at it for 15 years, trying to figure out how to design them properly. And then, as you know, on the West Coast, there's only one option off California is, is floating wind. You can't use fixed bottom winds because of the depth of the water off California's coast. So what? how much offshore wind is there um, on both coasts in the United States? There's enough offshore wind capacity within 50 miles to power the country four times over. And about 70 to 80 percent of our population lives in coastal states. So it does make sense for us as a nation to embrace floating wind and figure out how to do it cost effectively. Um, one advantage of floating wind is you can use it to minimize impacts on populations, visual impacts, ecological impacts, and human and fisheries impacts. And the reason for that is you can take these turbines almost anywhere within reason. You don't have to put them near the shore where the, where the water is shallow. You can put them 20 or 30 miles offshore or, or more, um, and thereby pick areas that would minimize impact on the environment, on the ecology, on the fisheries, uh, on, 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 on other, other users of the ocean. Um, you can also minimize offshore construction by you can actually build these units dockside like you build the ship and float it out to sea and minimize costs that way. But also, typically, winds are better farther offshore in most places, and so you can generate more energy by going farther offshore in most places. Um, so that's that's why we're going to floating wind. Well, on the east coast of the U.S., you've heard uh, the, the mayor say earlier, there's a lot going on. And these are, uh, in the northeast coast, different projects planned right now, but they're pretty much all fixed bottom because we have some shallow waters. But the next generation of offshore turbines will be in far, farther away from shore, both in New Jersey, New York, as well as in Maine, which will require floating turbines. Uh, notice there's a lot of goals out there uh, that's been, that, that have been set. Uh, New York has an aggressive goal of nine gigawatts of floating wind, for example. Now the US has a goal of 30 gigawatts and it's gonna be mostly fixed bottom wind by 2030. Uh, and, but the Biden administration just announced a goal of 15 gigawatts of floating by 2035. So you would add 30 to 15, you're at 45 gigawatts of announced goals by the U.S. by the U.S. administration right now. Uh, globally, what's going on? Well, globally, there's a lot going on in floating wind as well. There's a global wind uh, floating wind pipeline as of June uh, of this year of 121 gigawatts. There's a lot of gigawatts out there. That would cost roughly half a trillion dollars to build. So there's a lot going on. Uh, the U.S. under this particular study had a goal for the U.S. of eight gigawatts uh, by by 2030, uh, but uh, but uh, but this there's going to be a lot more than that. California alone is looking at 25 gigawatts by 20 by 2045. Now, how do you design floating turbines? How do you make sure they actually work? In in major in the majority of countries. Um, we started with doing testing in laboratories, then went and built single turbines of different designs. And in Japan and Europe, they put single turbines out there. After they've learned from a single turbine, they went out there and built arrays of turbines. And there's a bunch of arrays of multiple turbines that float right now that are being built. And you could see some of them out there on this map. And finally, once you build enough arrays and learn from that, then you can go ahead and build larger, tur larger uh, uh, scale farms. And larger scale farms in the U.S. will likely be starting in 2030 plus. So we have some time between now and then to home in some of these designs and, and, and learn from these single and array projects before we scale up. Now, how many different designs of floating turbines are there? I've almost lost track right now. There's so many of them out there. And you can see here different designs uh, of floating turbines. Uh, and these designs um, uh, have different pros and cons each. Uh, but they really come in in four different categories of floating turbines. And um, the, the, the one that we're most interested in uh, in Maine is called the semi-submersible, which is the third one from the left. Uh, there are uh, designs that are called tension leg platforms. Some of them are, are, are called uh, uh, almost like a barge design, if you wish. And finally, the, the, the one on the right-hand side is called the spar design. If you have real deep waters near the coast, you could do that. 
the very first floater of the U.S. of the world coast was a spire design uh, at the time uh, put off the coast of Norway. It's a two megawatt machine uh, that uses a spire design. And, and the way it works is the spire is like a big hollow tube that has a mass at the bottom that keeps it uh, upright. Think of it as taking a, 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 a bottle of water, uh, emptying the water out and putting some sand at the bottom and putting it in the bathtub. It's going to stand up vertically uh, and because you have a mass at the very bottom. And, and this is a very big uh, bottle of water. Essentially, it can go underwater 300 feet and can have a diameter of 25 feet with, with, a, with iron ore at the very bottom to keep it straight up. Um, but in addition to the hull itself, it has three mooring lines on it to keep it on station. In other words, uh, if if the wind blows, it can't really go too far because it's it basically moored to the seabed with three mooring lines, just like a ship would be moored. So this design is borrowed from the oil and gas industry. And it's called the spar design. The, this, this design uh, uh, that I'm pointing at right now is called the semi-submersible, and it acts like a ship, like a vessel. And this particular one has three uh, three flotation columns and the towers at the center and three mooring lines. The advantage of the semi-submersible is it'll draft about 25 feet dockside, so you can pull it out of port and move more and tow it, tow it to, to its final location. Whereas the spar design requires 300 plus feet of water, and you're not going to have that at a port facility unless you're in Norway, which is where which, which where this design was first tried. Um, moving on, what are the opportunities and challenges for California? Uh, California, as you know, is going to have a lease auction coming right up. Uh, for three different lease areas. That's big. That's going to be the first lease auction in the United States. Congratulations for floating wind. And Cal the California CEC has a goal of 25 gigawatts by 2045. And the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed is going to help a lot to drive the cost down for these technologies. So all of these are real good opportunities. So, but what are the challenges with California? Well, California has deeper waters than any other uh, uh, tests of these floating turbines. Uh, that's taken place so far in the world. So California has over uh, nearly a thousand uh, meters or over 3,000 feet of water, depending where you are. Uh, that adds cost and risk to these units. And when you have long mooring lines that are, you know, 3,000 plus feet long, uh, that adds cost, of course, and that adds risk because no, no one's built anything this big yet, uh, this deep yet. And uh, the Morro Bay, for example, has about a thousand meters or 3,000 feet of water depth. The Humboldt Bay project is a bit less than that, about 759 meters. Uh, so, so that will impact the design of the moorings and anchors. How do we moor these? Uh, one of the most common ways to moor floating turbines is called a drag anchor. You can see it right over here. It looks like a plow, uh, and, and you drag it along the seabed, and it embeds itself in the mud. And then you can't pull it out anymore because you've, you've, it embeds itself 40 or 50 feet in the mud. Uh, but you can actually, if you pull it the other way around, you can pull it out of the water. That's that's the most inexpensive um, mooring anchor use, and that's what we've planned to use in Maine. But when you go to California and you have deeper waters, you may not be able to use that design um, because it um, because of the way the loads are, are, are shed into it. You may have to use different anchors, as you see right over here. Uh, you may um, have to use a suction pile or torpedo pile or vertical load anchors. These are different anchor types to moor these into the seabed and deep waters. The other uh, um, challenge you'll have in California is because you have deep waters, you can have long electric cables from the mooring line to the seabed. Do you float the electric cable in the, in the, in the water line or do you take it down to the seabed uh, from every unit? Um, the cable that comes from the unit to the seashore is called a dynamic cable, um, and that cable needs to move around with the turbine because the turbine moves around as well. You also have earthquakes to deal with. So how do you design these mooring lines and anchors so, so you don't have liquefaction of the soils and, and you lose a mooring line and an anchor? Uh, there's thoughts to be done there. Uh, what's really important, uh, not only in California, but we need specialized port facilities to build these units. Uh, if you want to build 25 gigawatts by 2045, that's a gigawatt a year. Where are we going to build them? Uh, and uh, we need a workforce to do so. We need to scale up manufacturing, local manufacturing, and vessel construction. We need vessels to build these and take them out there and, and maintain them. So we need to de develop a whole industry to build these vessels and, 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 and maintain these, these systems. Uh, we also, if we're going to get there, we need to speed up our permitting, but at the same time addressing environmental equity concerns that we've all heard about today. 
Plus, you need offshore substations that need to float up in the ocean. So, so basically, that's that's the place where you aggregate all the power from all the turbines offshore, and you bring two or three cables from there to shore. So we need floating substation designs as well um, for the California environment for deeper, deeper waters. So there's a lot of opportunities, but there are also some challenges. But they're all um, challenges that we believe can, can be addressed. Um, there's also a big race going on to build bigger and bigger turbines. If the challenge isn't big enough, uh, there's a, a conventional wisdom this, these days that the bigger the turbine are, uh, the less of the cost of the offshore wind is. Uh, today, there's up to 15 megawatt turbines, 12 to 15 megawatt uh, being used. To give you a sense of scale, each blade is bigger than a football field. And now they're going, they're going bigger. There are plans now for 20 plus megawatt turbines. Today, our team is designing projects for Europe that are using 25 megawatt turbines, but those won't be built till 2030, and these turbines don't exist yet. But but um, but as you, you increase the size of these turbines, uh, one, one challenge we have is that we're not industrializing any particular size. All, we have three major turbine suppliers um, uh, 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 in the Western world right now, and, and they're all kind of competing to build a bigger turbine, but none of them making enough of any one of them. Um, uh, to industrialize and drive the cost down. So there needs to be a time where we need to all take a deep breath, pick a size and not, and, and, and industrialize that size and, and build plants, if you wish, uh, like in California and other places, uh, to industrialize it and drive costs down. Uh, I'm going to turn the, the, the picture to Maine a bit. Um, Maine uh, is the most heavily reliant state on, on heating oil to heat our homes. Um, so, um, and that's very polluting, and we send a lot of our um, uh, costs and energy costs uh, overseas um, uh, to uh, to oil companies to, um, to to buy oil to heat our homes and, and to drive our cars. So, um, there's a, a there's a plan in Maine to electrify heating and transportation, just like you've heard in California. And what we determined is that if we use just three percent of the Gulf of Maine area within 50 miles, we can heat every home and drive every car would use electrical heat pumps to heat homes and, and use electric cars. And we'd need about five gigawatts of offshore wind uh, to electrify heating and transportation in Maine. So this is a, so we put a plan in Maine called Crawl Before You Walk, Walk Before You Run plan. We call it the 110-100 plan. So back in, in 2013, we deployed the first floating turbine off the US coast. We built it in our lab. It was a one to eight scale version of a bigger unit. Um, uh, in the next two years, we're going to start construction of an 11 megawatt full-scale floater. We call it the New England Aquaventus project. In the 26-27 time frame, we're going to build 10-15 megawatt turbines. We call that the main research array. And these are all, if you wish, uh, crawl before you walk or crawl and, and then uh, walk before you run type approaches to reduce uh, the potential for mistakes. Uh, to uh, to understand the impact on the environment, to develop the supply chain. So when we're ready to build bigger ones, we understand all these issues. So we see commercial projects that really that will be in a 2030 plus time frame. In the meantime, we're getting ready. So one turbine and 10 turbines and 100 turbines, if you wish, that's the plan that we have in Maine today. And many other places around the world have also approached it this way. Uh, this is a, the first floater that we deployed off the U.S. coast. It was built, built in our lab. It was made out of concrete because we wanted it to last longer in the water. It was designed for a 100-year life. And um, But notice, even though it was 1 to 8 scale, it's not tiny. You could see what it looks like with people under it. We built it in our lab and deployed it, um, um, uh, towed it out to sea from um, Brewer, Maine. Uh, um, it was assembled. We uh, we had it on three trucks, uh, arrived to the, to the facility in Brewer. Um, assembled it there and put it into the water and towed it out to sea. So notice the unit is already built, and you're towing the unit to sea. Uh, it's got three uh, flotation columns, one on each corner. And if any of you have have, um, have sailed a catamaran that has two hulls, think of it as a trimaran here that has three hulls. And the farther the, you put the hulls apart, the more stable it is, and the bigger you make the hulls, the more stable it is. So you can design that for almost any environment. Um, uh, uh, that, that you want to encounter. So this unit's being towed out to sea. We towed it out in about 15 hours. And we placed it off Castine, Maine. And this is the unit off Castine, Maine in June 2013. And we had an undersea cable that brought the, the, the power back to shore. Uh, and, um, and that was the very first time offshore wind electrons uh, got on the grid in the United States. 
and it happened to be a floating turbine. So actually, the first turbine off the U.S. coast was actually a floating turbine. Uh, just to show you, uh, for those of us who are very concerned about how, how is it going to hold up, this is an extreme storm called Winter Storm Electra on December 15th, 2013. And what you see blown across is actually snow. That's not clouds, that's snow. And relative to the size of the hull, you see the white caps. Um, so the, this was a 50-year event, roughly 60-foot waves relative to the size of the hull. And as you look at that hull, you don't really see it move. So the key here is developing designs that will really withstand these kinds of environments. That's what we're spending a lot of our engineering time doing. Uh, and, and notice here it's done very well, and it matched up with our predictions. We had 50 sensors on board to tell us how it performs. For, the, for, for those questioning, uh, is it going to hold up out there? The answer is, with proper engineering, yes, we can. And, and, but there are still challenges, particularly with the deep water off California's coast, that need to be addressed. Uh, so off the coast of Maine, we have two projects right now the, the, that we're planning. The Aquaventus project, which is about 14 miles off the coast, uh, off uh, an island off the coast of Maine. And then the Mira project, the Maine Research Array, which is 20 miles south of that, which will have 10 units, 10, 15 megawatt units. Those are our two projects right now. If you wish, that's crawl, then walk before we run. Uh, and uh, running will be in 2030 for us. Um, the design we've selected was developed at the University of Maine. It's called Volturnus. And our goal was to develop a design that could be made locally so we can create local jobs. We didn't want to import the hulls from somewhere else. We wanted the jobs to be local and to develop a local supply chain. So we use, we're building a hull like you build segmental concrete bridges. So many of you in California built segmental concrete bridges. And we wanted to turn bridge builders into hull builders so basically the jobs can stay local. And uh, we have um, the Department of Energy is investing in our technology, as well as two private companies, RWE and the Mitsubishi Corporation. Um, this is another shot of what the hull looks like, just to give you a sense of how we bring the power to shore. So the hull itself, uh, the power is generated, of course, at the turbine level. It comes down the tower, down through electric cable, and the cable comes down from the bottom of the hull through a J-tube. And, and it, it, it takes a, um, a curve like that. It's, we call it the lazy S or lazy S curve with the buoyancy units on it. And the purpose for that lazy S curve is to allow um, the, the, uh, the cable to follow the hull as the hull moves around. Because the hull is more to the seabed, just like a ship is, depending on the wind direction and wave direction, the hull will actually move around. Not a lot, but it will move around enough that the cable has to follow it. So we call that the dynamic cable. So each unit is going to have a dynamic cable coming out of it that takes the bend and back into the seabed. It's, then it's a tethered to the seabed, and then eventually uh, you have an export cable. Um, that, that that goes to shore if you have a single turbine project. If you have 100 turbines, you may put 10 of them, daisy chain 10 of them back to back, to back and every 10 would have a cable. The cable comes together into a substation offshore, and then from a substation to shore, you might have two or three cables for redundancy. Like These are called export cable. This one is called an inner array cable, and the, the cable that brings the power back to shore that's 30 miles long uh, could be uh, is called the export cable. Uh, now, the mooring lines, what do they look like? Now, initially, when this industry started, we started using steel chains. And to give you a sense of scale, that's a six-foot human being. That's one ring of that chain. So these are not very tiny chains. Um, but but uh, when you get to deeper waters, uh, it's, it's less expensive to go to synthetic mooring lines. These are polyesters. Uh, type or, 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 um, uh, or other types of uh, resin systems where you can make these uh, uh, these. Um, uh, the synthetic chains, the synthetic ropes, and the ropes are about 1 20th the weight of a steel chain. They'll weigh a lot less, but easier to install. And in California, you're probably going to have to go to a rope systems because of the depth of the water that you have. Uh, uh, but but that's uh, but uh, people ask me, are you concerned about whale entanglement? The answer is no. These, these ropes are so big and these chains are so big that you're not going to get a whale entangled into that at all. There's not even a possibility of that happening. So, um, because of the sheer size of these units. Um, now, the export cable is a big part, and that's an issue, one of the biggest issues you face in building an offshore wind turbine is, where do you bring the power back to shore? Where do you route it in the seabed to, uh, to minimize the impact on the fisheries and, and other uses, sensitive areas, and so forth? Typically, what you like to do is bury the cable. You'd like to bury the cable, if you can, in the mud, six feet or seven feet or eight feet, 
in the mud to prevent it from being snagged by fisheries and other activities. But oftentimes you just can't do that because you can't. You have rock outcrops that you can't get away from. In the in the Gulf of Maine, we have a lot of rock outcrops that we have to deal with. Uh, so to give you a sense of what uh, of a survey we just finished of the seabed in, in the Gulf of Maine, uh, initially we had a route for our project that's shown in the center of the estimated cable route, and then uh, that's what we thought we'd bring the cable in. That we went out and made a survey of the seabed. When we finished the survey. We, we figured that where we thought we we're going to run the cable is rock, rock outcrops that you really can't bury the cable. So we started finding a way to reroute the rocks, the, the, the cable around the rocks, so you can bury most of it. But even then, we couldn't bury all of it. We could, we're likely to be able to bury 50 or 60 percent of it. The rest of it, we have to run it over rocks and cover it, if you wish, with what we call concrete blankets uh, or, or rubble, if you wish, so you can protect the cable. One of the big concerns with these offshore wind farms is is um, is snagging the cable or or breaking a cable, uh, and that's one of the biggest, um, if you wish, sources of claims from insurance is cables. Uh, if you look at Europe and and the projects they've been building since '91, that's something to really be carefully designed. In California, uh, that's something you got to look at very carefully. Where do you put these cables to protect them from from being damaged um, uh, during operations? Uh, and what do you do if there is earthquakes with the cables and so on? Things to be to be to, to also be considering. Um, to give you a sense um, of the moorings and cables again, um, uh, if you were to use a steel chain uh, in California, uh, uh, you would have uh, it, um, uh, what you see in red. A rope uh, would be more more taut, taut rope. And, and again, this is eight eight to ten inch diameter synthetic rope that's all taut. You can have hundreds of tons of force on it. And you're not going to get whales entangled to that. So so I, I just want to lay that to rest. Don't worry about the whales. Now, are you going to be worried about uh, noise and vibration and so forth? As I said, uh, Europe has had flow, offshore wind turbines. There's more than 6,000 turbines in Europe right now. Studies have been done. Uh, and, 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 uh, and problems with, with noise and vibration with, with fisheries had not been an issue at least uh, for the experience we have in Europe, but every ecosystem in different places of the world has different fisheries that may be affected by this. So stu careful studies have to be done to ensure that the local fisheries aren't affected by the noise and vibrations. Now, uh, the next project we have in Maine is the Maine Research Array to help study some of these noise and vibration and fisheries issues. And so it's going to have up to up to 12 turbines, but we think it's going to be 10, 15 megawatt turbines right now. So that's how we start to walk before we we crawl. Now we're going to be walking, and that's that's in 2027. Um, and um, uh, then the the last piece I'd like to talk about is is um, to to try to get and, and people have alluded to this. We need port facilities in the U.S. to do this. We don't have enough port facilities. I would say there is zero port facilities that can that can handle floating turbines at the scale that we want right now. So there needs to be a federal investment and state investments and industry investments to build these facilities. And these facilities could be 50 to 100 acres. Uh, they could cost 250 to 500 million dollars for facilities. So they're not really cheap. And they require permitting themselves. Um, they require uh, pr proper location and so forth. Um, I know Hubble Bay is looking at doing a port in California. Um, so, and the bigger the port is, the faster you can you can get these units out. Now, in California, you have a goal of 25 gigawatts by 2045. That's a gigawatt a year. Uh, that's at least 50 to 60 units every year. That's a unit every week. So you need a port facility to be able to deploy these units um, one per week. Uh, uh, so it needs to be big enough and designed properly to do that. So there needs to be a lot of effort to develop facilities that could do that and enough of them both on the east and west coast. So to final, to, to summarize here, we've talked about a lot, but uh, but floating wind right now is a U.S. earth shot by the, by the Biden administration. It's a big deal. It's a national uh, target to be able to get the cost down to 45 cents a kilowatt hour by 2035. Um, the floating wind can, is maturing globally. Uh, engineering is advancing significantly. A lot of us are doing the 110, 100 plans. Do one, then do 10, then eventually learn from all that before you, you start building larger firms. California will benefit from that and will be part of that. 25 gigawatts by 2045 is feasible, but requires significant planning in California. The Inflation Reduction Act you've all heard about is going to be a big plus to drive costs down and incentivize uh, industry. 
But California have, has very deep waters. That's going to add costs. A thousand feet, uh, three thousand feet of water on the mooring lines and anchors will add costs. It will add risk. Earthquakes will add risk. Um, offshore substations that will float in 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 a thousand to three thousand feet of water, I should say, uh, will also be required to be developed. And dynamic cables to go to those substations will need to be developed. Uh, California needs to maximize its local supply chain, the manufacturing infrastructure, training, and jobs. Um, uh, we're all going to need specialized port facilities. Um, to in, we, need to in, we need to make turbines locally to create local jobs. And 25 gigawatts in California is enough to incentivize turbine suppliers to set up shop. Uh, so you, you, at, at the scale you're developing in California, you can attract the, the supply chain to your state. Um, but you also need to produce vessels to build these units and tow them out there and to maintain them. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, in terms of electrical infrastructure that needs to be developed uh, and thought through very carefully at a statewide level, maybe at a regional level as well, so you can cut costs down. If each project has to bring its own cable to shore, that's going to drive costs up significantly and slow things down. But if there's a statewide plan to develop um, an offshore grid infrastructure, if you wish, uh, that will drive costs down to the consumer and, and, and speed things up. We need to plan for recyclability and reuse. Again, when you build that many units, you're going to have 25 gigawatts. Uh, so you might have uh, uh, hundreds of these units out there um, and that needs to be maintained and hopefully recycled. Um, and, and finally, the challenge of, of permitting that much in such a short time is, 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 is not a simple challenge either. How do you protect the environment, protect local stakeholders, protect the fisheries, protect indigenous communities, while you also speed, speed up permitting enough so we make a difference with global climate change? So it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to talk to all of you. You can, you can get uh, my contact information is on the lower right-hand corner. Uh, we would love to collaborate between Maine and California. So if there's opportunities to collaborate, we'd love to have you over here to see what we're doing and, 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 and see if we can move all the needle together. Thank you. Uh, we have time for uh, a couple of questions. Um, does anyone have questions for Dr. Dagger? Okay, I have I have one question, which is, um, it seems like Europe has really uh, leapfrogged uh, in terms of getting out um, uh, technology over 6,000 turbines. We heard from uh, uh, former assembly person Chu. Um, what uh, curious what your perspective would be on what the United States needs to do to catch up with Europe, uh, so to speak. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've covered some of that in my present in in a, in a presentation, but uh, the U.S. still has an opportunity to lead in floating technologies, while Europe has done fixed bottom technologies, six thousand fixed bottom turbines. Floating is still in uh, at, at its infancy in Europe, and that's the future. So we have uh, created uh, the administration has created a nurse shot. I think the U.S. has an opportunity to lead in the floating uh, space. Um, uh, I think what we need to do is we need to work together. We need to work together on permitting. Permitting slows things down more than anything else. And stakeholder engagement, making sure we all work together. And everybody, everybody wins, the fisheries, uh, uh, local communities, uh, and, and so forth. And, and technology, we need to move forward on the technology side and keep investing in research and development. But what's really stopping all of us from doing any of this today at any scale is port facilities. So, um, so um, if you think about um, California, I want to have a port that will uh, that will put out one hull per week, which is what you would need if you wish to get to your uh, 2045 goal, 25 gigawatts by 2045. Um, that port needs to be designed and built uh, and to be financed. And and um, on the on the East Coast, we have the same issues. We do not have port facilities right now. So there needs to be. Um, 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 as part of the Earth shot that, that the president has has announced. Uh, we need to, to have uh, communication and collaboration between different parts of the government, including the Department of Transportation. We invest in port facilities, Department of Energy, we invest in R&D, and so on and so forth, Department of the Interior. Um, uh, and and uh, all of that has to work together. The Earthshot plans on that, and I think we need to go ahead and really make that happen by get, getting to work together um, uh, on all those aspects. Well, thank you so much. I re we really appreciate um, your, your very uh, insightful comments. I'm excited to continue the conversation with you.